Hello and welcome to this uh, Wanda webinar on control. Thank you for attending and uh, I would like to uh, get started now. So today uh, we want to present you about the control mo module in Wanda. Um, we assume that you are already a little bit familiar with Wanda, the uh, pipeline hydraulics package of uh, Deltares. If not, I can also recommend a previous webinar which explains some basic con concepts of Wanda which you can find uh, on the internet on YouTube. This uh, webinar will also be recorded and also later on we will put it on the internet. So today we want to talk about control, but before that uh, I want to say if you have any questions during this webinar you can just uh, type them in the, in the question box which you can see in the GoToWebinar screen and my colleague Michiel Tucker is available and he will try to answer the questions during this webinar and at the end we will also take to, some time to answer all your questions uh, <coughs> if you have any. So what I want to show today, first the basic concept of the Wanda control module, after that we will jump to Wanda and uh, we will show you how to build a simple control system and we will end today with um, showing off uh, the PID controller in Wanda, which is a special control component. But first, the basic concept. As you can see, a uh, control system in Wanda consists basically out of three parts. You have a sensor, and the sensor measures a certain quantity. Then you have the control blocks. Control blocks basically gets an input signal and converts it to an output signal and what's happening depends on the control block you're using. And finally you have the signal lines which basically connects the control blocks or connects the sensor to the control blocks or the control blocks to the hydraulic components. We will now go to each of these items just to explain a little bit more how they are working. So first uh, we have a look at the sensor. And the sensor, as I said, measures a quantity. Now, to make it immediately clear, we'll now jump to Wanda. So, and I will show you how you can how the sensor works. I'm just going to put a sensor in my model, and the sensor you can connect it to three locations in your model. You can connect it to a connection point, of, for example a pipe or a pump, and if you select the sensor you can see here the quantity, you get a drop down list where you can select which quantity you want to measure. So for example, say okay, let's measure the discharge here. What you also can do, with a new sensor in it, for example I can connect it to the control point of a component. Then if I look at the list, it's a different list. So and then I can measure the, uh, the component component specific outputs, like for example for a valve you have the valve position. But also you can measure the pressure loss. Now let's put it to valve position. And the final point where you can connect it to is to the nodes. So I can immediately connect it here to this node. If I then look at the drop-down list, then I can see I can measure the quantities of the nodes. So, I, for example, I can measure the head. And to show you the results, I will just run steady-state simulation. And that's finished. So, now we can look here. See here on the output channel it says it has a discharge of 3.4. And if I look here, I see a different quantity, but that's because one of the things you should always remember in using control, all the quantities are in SI units. And the SI units is not, it's what I have specified here, cubes per hour, but it is cubes per second. So that's why it's year 3.4. An easy trick, which is just a side issue here, you can do different things to see the SI units. For example, you can go here to the units, you can select here the SI units, and then you can see 
the discharge is 3.5 cubes per second, which is the same value as I have here for my sensor. An other trick which might be useful is to put this information button here in the selection property window. And if I then select the quantity, you can see here, down here, the same, this value in the different quantities, the different units which are available. And you can see also the SI units given first. Items where this becomes more important also is the, for example, the valve position, which is not 0 to 100 percent, but it's 0 to 1. And also the pump speed, which we normally use uh, RPM, but the SI unit is radial per second. As you can see here, which, which you can see that 580 RPM corresponds to 60.74 radials per second. So that is for the sensors and the different positions where you can connect it to. Next we have the control components. The control component has, has, has some input channels and that can be either zero, one or more depending on the component which you have. But you also have different type of channels. You have numerical channels which can have every value or logical which is true or false or it's, uh, it's used in one, uh, zero or one. And uh, the number of input signals depends on the type of component. So for example, if you have a PID SS, every input channel can only have one input signal. So there's also have the output, uh, then they have the output channel, which can be one, or for special components, it can be more. And again, it can be numerical or logical. And um, you can basically put an infinite amount of signal lines to a component at the output and connect it to as many components as you would like. Now, a good thing to note is that in the control components, all the red connection points are numerical channels and all the white connection points are logical channels. And of course, if you're going to look at uh, signal lines, you can understand that you should connect a numer numerical input to a num numerical output and a logical to a logical. Because otherwise, yeah, we basically don't know what should be happening. So, And if you try it, you get an error message that you're connecting the wrong type of connection uh, output channels to a wrong input channel. So that's with the signal lines and basically it connects the different control components together. So it connects a sensor to a control component and a co other contr can connect a control component to another control component and also a control component to an active H component, hydraulic component. And that's the last thing I want to note before we're going to s s uh, jump to Wanda. You cannot control all components. The, you can only control the what we call the active components and you can recognize them and you look in the help or you can look at the control connection point if it's red. As you can see here, for example, the pump has a red connection point, then it's active. It can, for example, control the speed. And for a valve, you can control the valve position. And for a Q bound, you can control the discharge. So that was very brief, the background of the control module of Wanda. To yeah, now we want to show it in action, so we're going to look now at the system which we want to control. We have here is a pumping station, pipeline, and two valves. Basically what can happen is, for example, you have a full pump strip. The pump strip can end the pressure wave going into your pipe. But at a certain moment you want to close these valves to minimize the, neck, the uh, minimum pressure. And for example, you want to close it if the pressure drops below one bar. So that's where we can use control for. So let's now go to back to one now. I'm going to just delete the sensors because I'm not going to need them. So now I want to build a control system which closes these two valves when the pressure here in this node drops below one bar. So what I'm first going to do is put in a sensor because I need to measure the pressure there. 
So that's the first thing I'm going to do. So second thing, I need a, I need a signal which becomes true when the pressure drops below one bar. So that's why I can use a condition. And in this condition, I can just choose the logical operator which I want to use. So I can have less than, greater than, less equal, greater, equal, equal, not equal. In this case, I'm going to say, okay, less than. Then I need to ve the value. So that's one bar. So that's 1 E5 Pascal, because it's an SA unit. Then you have here the reset time, which means that if the value drops below, and I put here a second uh, time for one second, for example, then the pressure needs to be one second below one bar before it starts operating. But I don't want it. I want immediately the action. However, the signal becomes false again as soon as the pressure becomes above this value. So I don't want that. I want it to keep, for example, wait five seconds before it can become true. So that's reset time false. I'm going to put it to five seconds. And at the moment the signal becomes true, then I need an action. So I'm going to put in the table, which if I zoom in a little bit more, you can see, has a logical input. And if this input becomes true, then the table is going to be used. So let's see, I put it at one and I close the valve in five seconds to zero. So I now only have to connect everything. So what I'm going to do is connect the sensor with the condition. So that the measured value is going into the condition. The condition compares it and then gives either a zero or one, which I can put into the table. And then I connect the table to the valve. And I have two valves. So I have to connect them both. So that's basically the control system. So now I'm going to press Shift F9 to start steady calculation. Now have to wait a little. Ooh. I get the steady message files and it means basically that there is some error and I'm going to look at that. You can see here inconsistent valve position between steady state results and control system. Modify the input. Okay, now let's have a look at the model. So let's see what's coming out of this table. It's saying that the output channel is 1. So that means the valve position of 100%. Now I'm going to look at the Valve position here, it's only 50%. There's the inconsistency. But that's also an important thing if you're using control. You have to ensure that your steady state is, uh, is in line with your control system or your control system is in line with your steady state. So what I have to do is I have to modify this table that it doesn't start at 1 but at 0 0.5. So it's easy to do. I just put this one to 0 0.5. So now let's see. Press Shift F9 again. It's running. And let's go back to one now. No, there's no error. So what I can do now is just run the transient to see how, you control, how the control system is behaving. So again, we get some errors about cavitation, but that's not a problem at this moment. So let's have a look here at the pump. As you can see, I let the pump trip. And if you want to look at the pump speed, you can see it's tripping. Of course, there's some dynamic behavior which influences the, the rotation of the pump, the pump speed. So let's have a look here what's happening here. If you zoom here a little bit, you can see pressure is dropping and here it drops below one bar. Let's jump then to the condition. You can see what's happening. It's first zero, and at the moment, it drops below one bar. It becomes true. So at that moment, let's just drop this one in here. You can see at that moment, when this one becomes true, the action table starts, and then it starts to close the valve. It goes from 0 0.5 to 0. And if we look at the valve position, you see the valve starts closing. And if you go then back to the pressure graph, what you see happening then, of course, the pressure is rising. And you see a lot of reflections. 
and there's some cavitation in the pipeline which gives also rise to some pressure changes. But the system is acting as yeah, as described, the valve is closing when the pressure drops below one bar. So now to go one step further, because at the end you don't want to also only to close the valve, but you also want to open it when the pressure is, for example, above 1.5 bar. So that's a little bit more complicated control system, and we also can make that. And for the time being, I already created this case. Same model, the only change I made is that instead of tripping the pump, I trip it and then I restart it. So and if the pump is restarting, then at that moment the pressure starts rising again and the valve should open. So that's why I put that in. Now again we have our sensor which measures the pressure. Then instead of using the condition, I'm using a level control switch. This level control switch, you put in two values, an on value, which is one value bar again. So that's the value when the pressure drops below this value then it becomes true. And I have an off value which is 1.5 bar. If the pressure rises above this value then the signal becomes false again. And again we have a reset time which I put for the on I put it to zero so immediately if the pressure drops below one bar it, the output signal becomes true. And the reset time off I put to 5 seconds. In the initial state I put to off. So it starts in the off phase. The tap component I replace it by the tap 2. The tap 2 has two tables. One if the signal becomes true and one of the if the signal becomes false. So in this case if the signal becomes true the valve should start closing. So that's basically the same table which I used for the previous case. And you can see it starts at 0 0.5 in 5 seconds it closes off tables basically the other way around. That's the valve needs to be start to open. So at zero seconds to zero, at five seconds it should be 0 0.5. So basically that's everything put in. So now let's have a look what's happening. If you're now going to look at for example here the valve position, here we see an interesting behavior. So the pumps Trip, so let's have a look also at the pressure. And here below, see the pressure is dropping. At that moment the valve starts closing. It's closed. But then the pressure rises. If the pressure is 5 seconds above 1.5 bar, then the valve starts opening again. But when the valve is opening, the pressure is dropping again. So then, at a certain moment, it drops below 1 bar, so it starts closing again. And you know, CT also happening. So it's basically not the behavior you want in your system. It's too dynamical. You want it more slowly. So what you can do then is change the behavior of your model and that's what I've done. To show it in the next case. The first thing I've done is I've put a reset time instead of 5 seconds I put it to 10 seconds. So it has to be longer above 1.5 bar before it's is allowed to open. The second thing is I increase the opening time, I make it a little bit more slower because if it's opened fast then the pressure drops rapidly and the pressure drops below one bar and starts closing again. So if you now want to look at the valve position you see it closes and then at a certain moment it starts to open. If you look at the pressure You see it drops below and then it closes and then it stays closed for some seconds because it's above here, above, it becomes above 1.5 bar but it's not long enough. And then it drops below one bar again so then it has to restart again. So the, the reset time is set to zero and then it has to wait again, the, uh, what did I put in, 10 seconds which it has to wait. So only if there are some time when the pressure is long enough above the uh, 1.5 bar, then it can open. It also has to do, of course, with the pumps, because the pumps also need to 
restart. That takes some time, of course. So, as you can see, it's easy to build a control system, but uh, you always have to anal analyze your results and check if your control system is acting as you th would expect and uh, how it should act also in reality, that you also always should take into account. There's also a lesson to keep in mind if you're building a more complicated control system, try to also test the control system before you uh, put it in your complete model, because yeah, maybe you made some errors and you'll have to wait a long time before you see your results, so always try to check your control system and see if it behaves as you would expect. So, then I want to go to the final thing, and that's PID controllers. And I have a case for that. This is a simple district heating system. You have here a circulation pump, which basically just pumps the water around. We have here a heat supply station, like a, for example a CHP plant, which uh, delivers the water always at 120 degrees Celsius. And here we have a delivery point where I specified a certain pattern in time. To make it better understandable, I'm just going to switch to hours instead of seconds. So you can see this is a simulation for one day. And it starts at uh, midnight and then the heat demand drops because it's night, nobody needs, you know, you only have a small demand of warm water and space heating. Then at morning, around between around six or something like that, then the heat demand starts increasing. And then you have your morning peak and then it drops a little bit and then at the evening it increases again. And that's our typical day pattern for the heating. And at the end what you want is that the return temperature which goes back to your CHP plant should be at a, um, and it's, for example, 70 degrees. So that's where we're going to use a PID controller for. There's a valve here, and this valve is controlled on the temperature here. Basically what we want to do is keep this temperature, as I said, on 70 degrees Celsius. What we do, we measure this, the temperature. It goes into this PID controller. PID controller has a certain set point of 70 degrees. It calculates the error, and based on this error, it starts uh, determining the output signal with a gain which is given and an integration time constant. And based on that, it tries to keep the temperature within certain boundaries. So let's first have a look at what's happening here at the temperature. Now look here, you see overall, we have here the 17 degrees, it stays nice within the boundaries and at the, more, at the moment when there is a decrease or increase, of course there's a jump in temperature and we have some reaction time for that and that's logical. So now if you look at the valve position, you can see when, for example here, when the heat demand drops, the temperature increases, the valve starts closing and discharge is dropping. So you can also plot the discharge. You can see the discharge is going down. And at this moment, the heat demand is constant, so there's no reaction. And in the morning, it increases, and then the valve needs to start opening. And you see it happening, and then it's constant for some time, and then it drops. And so this system, it works uh, nicely. So what I did is, uh, of course, at the end, you want to optimize the control. You want that your that your temperature stays as close to the 70 degrees as possible. So what I did is uh, I thought, okay, now let's make it a little bit more aggressive and I increased the gain. I have here an example for that. So I put it 25% higher. So instead of 0.002, I put it to 0 0.0025. So and if you now have a look at the, what's happening, you can see that it's overacting, it's, uh, the temperature goes too high, then it goes too low, and basically it's not controlling its, um, 
giving some feedback to itself and basically making a mess of the system. Also, if we're going to look at the bubbles, and you see here that's changing a lot in this period. So how you can view that if what is happening in the outputs, you can also look at the proportional part and the integrated part. If you compare them, they can say, okay, this looks relatively okay, but this is way too big. So basically, my proportional part is too big. So basically, it says, okay, my gain is too high. So we jump back to the other case. Just going to close these figures. And also have a look at the proportional part, the integrating part. You can see it looks much better. The proportional part is relatively small, which is okay, because if it's yeah, too big, you get this overshoots and uh, basically then it uh, opens, closes, open, closes, and basically you're not controlling it anymore. And the integrating part is nice doing what it should do and controlling the valve at the end. So that's uh, some basics about the PRM controller. And this was the final part of the presentation which I wanted to show to you. I want to point out that uh, in June there are the Deltares software dagen, which is in Dutch, and uh, during those days there will be also uh, Wanda courses also on control, so please look at our website if you are interested. And it's a little bit further, at the end of the year, in Oct end of October, beginning of November, there are the Delft software days, and again, uh, then there will be Wanda courses, and um, if there's more information, information about that, you'll be informed about that. In the future, probably we are, next month we are going to go have another webinar, and uh, if you have ideas on a uh, subject which you might find interesting, you can always uh, contact us and send us an email, or uh, you can also uh, yeah, put it now in the question uh, dialogue. Um, we will be available now to answer any questions if you have, and with that I would like to thank you for your attention and for attending this uh, webinar, and I hope it was useful for you. Wish you a pleasant day.